Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Picked by young girls, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever Where have all the young girls gone? Long time ago. Where have all the young girls gone? Gone to young men, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Soldiers gone, gone to pay God everyone. We have all the young men gone, gone to the soldiers everyone. We have all the soldiers gone, will they ever? We have all the graveyards gone. Long time passing, we have all the graveyards gone. Gone to flowers, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn?
Percussion, Dominic Gagliari on drums, Barry Kornhauser on cello, on cello, and guitar later. Matt Dean, Dean Friedman on, on sound, <laughs> Daryl Clark on bass, my good buddy Dean Friedman on sound, my brother Millard Owens on percussion. My name is Chris Owens. We're proud to be here at New Jersey Peace Action, and this is the start of the program. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, in, 19, in 1983, I began working on a collection of songs entitled Anyone's Revolution, one of which is called Save the Children, which is the song we're about to perform. This is only the second time the song has ever been performed live, and it's an honor to perform it here. But I just wanted to let you know that when I was writing songs 30 years ago, the President of the United States was Ronald Reagan. And I was not happy with Ronald Reagan. I don't think too many of us were. Now, 30 years later, I have to say, I really like our President. And today, in particular, I really like our President because he nominated my classmate and personal friend, Loretta Lynch, to be the next Attorney General of the United States, the first black woman Attorney General. However, however, all presidents of the United States, because they're presidents of the United States, need to be reminded that in their role as commanders in chief of our armed forces, we're there to remind them that they have a moral responsibility. And that moral responsibility, just like Franklin Roosevelt said, go out and make me do it, our responsibility is to say, please don't do it as much as you've been doing it. And that is killing children with our military hardware. So this song is entitled, Save the Children. I'm 
applause for the Owens Brothers Band, please. You will hear from them again a couple of times this afternoon um, as we move through our program. Um, I am really happy to see so many of you here. Oh, in case you don't know, although you just sang happy birthday to me. Uh, my name is Madeline Hoffman and I'm the director of New Jersey Peace Action. And I'm here, like you, to hear Theodora and Clinton Lacey speak on the topic of civil rights at 50, to create peace, try justice. We're, we will be honored to hear from a mother and son who have dedicated their lives to working for social and racial justice. As an as a side, oh, on that, uh, I think Theodora walked in right as I was calling her name. <laughs> Theodora Lacey has, is in the room. 
But as I was talking about mother and son, I want to, I would be remiss not to say something about the mother and son duo, um, also the other mother and son, son team that's gracing us today, the Owens Brothers Band, um, Mitty Owens and Chris Owens are the sons of Ethel Owens, who is also here. <laughs> and Ethel Owens was uh, married to former Congressman Major Owens in uh, New York and has been involved in civil rights for a very, very, for a very long time, taught at Howard University and such. So we are honored to have these mother and, and children duos and teams here in the room. You'll hear more about Theodora Lacey in a little while, but she began her work for civil rights in 1955 with Dr. Martin Luther King during the Montgomery bus boycotts. So um, we'll, we, I'm sure we'll learn a lot from her. Uh, the circumstances of the times pushed her into action. And so she thinks, or she hopes, that young people today will do whatever it takes, stand up for justice whenever and wherever necessary. Whether they were activists before or not, if there's an injustice, this is the time uh, and place to stand up and do something. And I guess more than, now more than ever, in the wake of events like the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, these kinds of, this, this kind of activism is necessary. As a peace organization, we believe it is important to think about the struggle for civil rights and where we are today because we know that without justice, there will be no peace, right? I know many of us have been on picket lines uh, with, with um, repeating the slogan, if there ain't gonna be no justice, there ain't gonna be no peace. And that's why we're here today with this program presenting these two individuals to you. Five days after 9-11, 2001, New Jersey Peace Action held an emergency meeting to discuss what our response to that would be. And we came up with a theme for our response. The theme was justice, not war. And if our officials, our elected officials, had heeded that, justice, not war, we might not be where we are today with wars all over the globe and people uh, suffering as a result of the bombs that have fall, fallen on their, on their countries. In Iraq, it's been in Iraq, it's been since 2003, um, and actually, really since 1991. If you want to go all the way back, and just yesterday or the day before, President Obama announced another 1,500 troops going back to Iraq once again. <laughs> yeah, let's. You know, I think we've had enough. Um, a war without end will not bring peace. Instead, there must be an effort to bring about justice. And then there's a chance for peace. And I was reminded of something Dr. King said, and I think you've all heard it before. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. And that's where we are today, um, except for the work that New Jersey Peace Action and other groups like us, ours are doing with a... <laughs> In your program booklets, the very back of the program booklet, there are two action alerts for you. The first one is on moving the money. Um, I spoke of Ethel Owens a few minutes ago. At our last soup luncheon, uh, well, sorry, this is not a soup luncheon anymore. It used to be, it's the fall gathering now. But at the last gathering, last fall, I was reading through what I had prepared for to, to speak about. And we are, at that point, we were one vote shy of the Montclair Town Council passing a move the money resolution. Today, I can stand here proudly and say that as of December 7th, 2013, the Montclair Town Council passed a move the money resolution <laughs> in support of asking Congress to move 25% of the money out of the military budget and into programs that fund community needs. And we need that now more than ever before. 
with the wars that are going on. Uh, New Jersey Peace Action did a lot of tabling this summer and fall, and the uh, most, inch, most um, noteworthy is when we tabled in Hoboken and Bloomfield right after the announcement was made that we were escalating, the United States was escalating the bombing of Syria and Iraq. We got so many postcards signed that day and petitions signed that day asking for moving the money from war to peace. And the people coming up to our table were saying over and over again, I don't know what this government is doing. I don't know what they're doing. Why are they continuing to spend money on war when we need the money at home? There were teachers and there were other types of you know, pe other people who were concerned not only about their jobs, but just about education in general and the state of education. For every bomb, how many teachers could we hire? For every plane, how many teachers could we hire? How many schools could we build? And so what we are finding today, I think, and I've spoken about this a lot in the last month, is a relationship between a militarized foreign policy and a militarized domestic policy here at home. Events like Ferguson, Missouri, show us what happens when the militarized foreign policy comes back home to roost. Because I don't know, I can still see it bright, large as life in my head of the women and men who are protesting or calling for justice for, um, in, the, in the shooting of Michael Brown, but being um, <laughs> confronted by an armored vehicle an armored vehicle that had been used in Iraq or Afghanistan and was donated to the police forces here at home. Are we at war with our own people too? Okay, and I know in Bergen County there's a current debate going on whether or not Bergen County should accept such military vehicles and we would say no, no. So we are working very hard um, in that regard. to move the money from war to peace, and to keep the uh, militari militarized foreign policy from coming home to roost. And I will say one other thing about the work that we're doing, because it's also in the pro program booklet. There is a um, petition to sign to call on Senator Booker and Senator Menendez to support continued negotiations with Iran and other countries involved with the P5, P1 plus 5, because, be, because of the work of the peace movement, people like us and the National Iranian American Council, who's here in the back. Um, Ali, raise your hand. And Maria, where are you? Maria Afsharian here. Um, in conjunction with grassroots people all over the country, we were calling for increased negotiation diplomacy, not war. And we were doing that last year. And as a result of that, there was, no, there was diplomacy, not war. There's a deadline, November 24th deadline coming up. And we want to make sure that our senators don't back down. We know Cory Booker, hmm? and we know Senator Menendez and where they stand on anything regarding Iran or the state of Israel. We know where they stand. And so we need to be, the, there's phone numbers for Senator Booker and Senator Menendez. You can do two things at once when you call. You can tell them to support anything that moves the money from war to peace and to continue negotiations with Iran um, because that's the only way real peace will be, will be achieved. So, I think, yeah, the, well they can, they can, there are two things you can do. You can sign the petition online because there's a link there or you can sign the petition in the back of the room. Um, Ali is standing right, right in front of it. Um, okay, let's see. I'm almost done because I know we're running on a tight timetable. I just want to tell you one thing that we'll be, other thing we'll be working on in the year ahead. You'll be hearing from us about it. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference is coming up in 2015 uh, in uh, New York at the United Nations. And I'm serving on an international planning committee to help bring a conference and a march and rally against nuclear weapons nuclear and for nuclear abolition. Just prior to that, we'll be calling on you to do things through the course of the year. 
We were funded by the Puffin Foundation uh, as part of, uh, supported by them for this effort. We're very grateful for that. And so, uh, we've had a very, very busy year, and I think I'm being told that I need to move off the microphone. So, <laughs> we've, um, there's more that we did in terms of dedicating new peace sites, and we're, we'll be dedicating one in Hackensack on November 22nd. The Center for Modern Dance Education, Ruth Neustadter has, has cards there. So we work against war and for peace. And so as we continue to gain strength and visibility, we want you to be a part of that. We'd like for you to help to be a part as a volunteer. There's some volunteer forms scattered on some tables there. If you want to volunteer for us, please write something in and leave your page by the registration table and we'll call on you. And also, um, yes, if you want to volunteer, if you want to, if you want to also support us financially, I think Kit Marlowe will be talking about that right now. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Fellow citizens, a plague is stalking the earth today. A plague that incapacitates its victims, spreads by contact and threatens the very fabric of our society. You may think I'm talking about the Ebola virus. You would be wrong. I am speaking about fear and hatred and the militarism that they feed. Like Ebola, there are no vaccinations against fear. People acquire it through contact with the contaminated products of affected persons. No medicine can cure fear or violence. You can only provide palliative care until the victim's spirits recover from the harm. So in the fight against this plague, who protects the innocent like Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, does for that other plague? Why, it's the peace movement. In this part of New Jersey, NJ Peace Action embodies the peace movement. Other progressive organizations know us. Our congressional delegation knows us. Newspapers and media know us. Each of you is stronger for your affiliation through New Jersey Peace Action. We've seen great successes in the past year, as Madeline just described, including an influx of young people. Things are getting ready to turn around. I know that we don't make progress as quickly as you would like. However, in the face of the recent election, we should recognize that the alienation of, of Americans continues to prevent an outbreak of hostilities against Iran. Every day that goes by is a victory against hate and fear. Our, last year, our efforts, combined with those of many others, helped the US, Iran, and other countries arrive at a negotiated agreement. The next deadline for this negotiated agreement is the 24th of this month. NJ Peace Action will continue to work to see that that negotiated settlement is extended. Of course I say all of this because I want your support to keep NJ Peace Action successful. In order to create the change you wish to see in the world, we need to have a place to meet, we need to find out who each other are, and we need to have organizers help us put programs and projects together. Our total annual budget is not much higher than the income of a single middle class New Jersey family. We stretch that budget to keep several people working in a rented office. That leverage that members get for their donations is astounding. Now I hope to raise $10,000 from those of you here in the room. When you see one of the charming board and committee members walking around with baskets, members wave baskets. Let me see a couple of baskets wave. Okay, there we go. When you see these charming persons walking around, I hope that you will donate generously. To donate, put cash in the basket. Or place a check, preferably a large one in the basket. Or complete the pledge form. What color is the pledge form this week? It's white this year with a peace sign on it. Yeah, don't fill out the red ones that say Republican Party. <laughs> complete the pledge form on your table to use your credit card or complete that pledge form to show how and when you will send money in the future. If you promise to give money once a quarter or once a month, that makes you a sustainer, our favorite kind of member. Because knowing when the money's coming in helps us plan ahead and succeed better. 
while you write these, uh, write these pledge forms, checks, and dig into your pockets to take out some cash, the Owen Brothers Band will offer us some mu music to write checks by. This song is written by our band member, Celia Spruill. It's called Poverty Sucks. So we thought it was most appropriate to have this as the uh, music to write checks by. <laughs> Only we're taking it to the next level. Well, I'm broke, broker than a broke dick dog, and I'm hungry. Haven't been greased so long that I'm starving like Marvin. Like to be scoffing some chicken and greens in the well of my dreams. I've been running around looking like a day old bone. I like to crash, but I ain't got no home. I've been sleeping on the ground. Lord, I'm feeling down. I like to laugh, but lately all I do is sound poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. You know, once upon a time I was living large, I had it soft. I didn't push too hard, I had plenty of money. Life was so sunny, had plenty of friends, thought that it wouldn't end. But then Reagan Novice came and kicked my ass, I took a fall. Looked like I fell so fast, lost my J-O-B, and I lost my home. Now I'm feeling very much alone. I'm telling you, poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. It doesn't take a genius or a super brain to see that the economy is going down the drain, whether we like it or not. We're going to pot, poor people get a little and the rich a lot. While the very course of living's in the high octane, the ruling classes are reacting like they're going insane. Making plans to attack all the teens who are black, while the poor are persecuted for the things they lack. They know they got a notion that they king of the ocean, and every single move they make will put the world in motion. I got the busted bubble, there's going to be some trouble. If they don't change their attitude, they're going to get in trouble. The not was toleration, surviving in the nation. Our leaders got older, that invites regurgitation. It goes against the grain. The system is the same. I got to tell our all and make it plain. I'm telling you, poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Everybody. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Ain't no job for me, I need to home. Tired of this poverty, you people think we're like welfare. Suckers just don't care, running for me like I'm the enemy. All I wanna do is hold my head up high and be a man. And when the streets bye bye, get my ass kissed to the trickle down blues. You will probably see it on the news. I'm, I'm telling, telling you, poverty, poverty sucks. sucks. Poverty sucks. 
everybody say poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Say what you say. Poverty sucks. Say what you say. Poverty sucks. Poverty sucks. Say what you say. Poverty sucks. Write those checks, everybody. Write those checks. Poverty sucks. See you Woo! Woo! And this award says New Jersey Peace Action bestows upon the Martin Luther King Birthday Committee this Peace Action Winter Soldier Award for their enduring commitment to honoring the work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. through educational programs and events presented on this day, Saturday, November 8, 2014, Madeline Hoffman, Director, Judith Arnold, President, New Jersey Peace Action. Thank you, Thank you. Say a word. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say it's very humbling for me as being one of the newest kids on the block on this committee. As Larry said, it began in 1969, so it's been going on for four decades. I've only been part of it for the last six years. But I must say, it's through the guidance and leadership, and personally for me, the mentorship of Theodora Lacey and all the committee members who have given up their time all year long to make sure that the birthday celebration that we do each year on Dr. King's birthday is so successful. We recognize students in Bergen County, we give a scholarship, we have wonderful speakers, it's a great event, and anytime you're in Bergen County on Dr. King's birthday, look us up, because we'd be very happy to show you what we're all about and what we're gonna to continue to do. So I thank you very much, New Jersey Peace Action for presenting us with this. As I said, I'm humbled, but my committee graciously accepts this award. Thank you. And this, I just wanted to introduce this briefly because this will be, is this, some, this is a song from the Civil Rights Movement? Or at least one, a sing-along to get us in the mood to hear Theodora and Clinton Lacey, and we thank the Owens Brothers Band in advance for this song. Thank you. This is a, a trilogy, a trilogy. So 60s, civil rights all rolled into one. So we'll, 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 we're gonna cue you when you, we'd like you to join us, okay? But we know you'll recognize like every, every piece of this. Oh! 
Oh, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I be a slave, and before I'm in my grave, I'm gonna fight for my right to be free. the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. Through no many dangers, no celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And next year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the March on Selma. And in light of the recent elections, we will continue celebrating these anniversaries and having to celebrate these anniversaries because they remind us that we have fallen short of the Glad to see so many familiar faces and some unfamiliar. Is that good uh, today? Yes, yes. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So I am honored today to give the Hope Shapiro Bread and Roses Award to two activists whom I have known for about 30 years. 
It's named for a longtime Peace Action member and volunteer, and it is given to activists who represent the dedication and love for humanity, peace and justice that Hope did. What I'd like to do is give Theodora and Clinton their awards, and then they'll speak. So I'll do the presentations first. Um, I met Theodora in the early 1980s when I became the representative of Bergen County St. Freeze to the MLK Birthday Committee meetings. In the mid-80s, Bergen County St. Freeze participated in the Bridges for Peace program, which was an exchange of citizens with the U.S. and the USSR at that time. Um, Theodora was one of the two people who traveled to the Soviet Union to represent us. She came back and spoke to churches, schools, civic groups, discussing her experiences over there and talking about all the people she met, the regular citizens. These were the days when it was seriously questioned whether we should have any contact with the Soviet Union uh, as citizens. And then we brought a larger group of Soviets here uh, as the completion of this very successful exchange. Uh, Theodora has been leading the MLK Birthday Committee before that and, and uh, obviously after. And I've been working with her all these years and it's, it's really an honor. She has been instrumental in getting the Martin Luther King Monument erected on the Fairleigh Dickinson campus in Hackensack. And there's a long list of awards she has received for her work in education, in relations between African Americans and uh, non-African Americans, uh, in civic leadership. All of her awards are justly deserved. Today, we want to present the Hope Shapiro Bread and Roses Award to Theodora for her lifelong commitment to civil rights. And would you like to come up, Theodora, and I'll read this. New Jersey Peace Action bestows upon Theodora Lacey the Hope Shapiro Bread and Roses Award for her pioneering and steadfast leadership in the struggle for civil rights, and signed by Madeline Hoffman and Judith Arnold. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, when I was a little girl, we often had to do, we all, often had to run errands when I was a little girl for our neighbors. But that was, and each time we would run an errand, go take in coal or wood or run to the store uh, for a neighbor, they would often give us a penny or candy or fruit. But that was one neighbor who never gave us anything. And so I complained to my grandfather about that. I said, that's not a nice neighbor. She's a mean neighbor. She never gives us anything for running errands. He said to me, you want to do some things that you are not paid for out of the goodness of your heart, and then you will live a long and rich life. I've never forgotten that. So today, I accept this wonderful award, but now I'll have to go and find something to do because you've already paid me. So I met Clinton at the same time that I met Theodora, um, and that's 30 years ago, and have seen him every year at the MLK annual celebration in Bergen County, where he helps make the event extremely successful. And he's continuing the tradition of Lacey activism. Clinton is the Deputy Commissioner, Adult Operations in the New York City Department of Probation. He has been working with youth and families in the criminal justice system for 25 years, having been director of the Youth Justice Project at the Vera Institute of Justice, 
and he's been a project manager at the Haywood Burns Institute, training uh, those who work with youth and families in the system. And now he's supervising 27,000 clients on probation, and he's leading initiatives to reform the policies and practices of the probation department. Um, Clinton, would you like to come up and get your award? And then maybe we can bring Theodora back up and the two of you will speak, is that, uh, or however you That's want to fine. do it. Okay, yes. Yes. so New Jersey Peace Action bestows upon Clinton Lacey the Hope Shapiro Bread and Roses Award for his commitment to supporting young people in the criminal justice system and working to raise awareness of the racial disparities that persist within it. And it's signed by Madeline Hoffman and Judith Arnold. Just briefly, I'd like to say thank you very much. I'm very honored and very surprised. I didn't know that uh, I'd be getting an award, but I'm humbled and really grateful and, and equally grateful to have the opportunity to serve and to continue in the legacy of my mother, of my father, of all of you here, and the thousands of others who have, have struggled through the years to get us to where we are today. I know I stand on the shoulders of giants and um, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to continue this great work. So thank you. I share this award with all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. To the dedicated and wonderful members of the New Jersey Peace Action, how grateful we are to have you. And I've known through the years the great work that you do. We admire you, and we give you our full support. To all the community leaders, family, and friends who are assembled today, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I really feel quite at home because you see, about 20 years ago, my daughter Mickey and son-in-law Derek moved to this area. So I've had the opportunity for all those years to visit this lovely part of New Jersey. But today is a special day because I'm getting to be and to see all of you. As I walked into the room today, one of the musicians said, oh, I'm sorry you didn't get to hear us play, but we're going to play again. How grateful I am that I was able to hear them play. As a matter of fact, I almost wanted to say, let's just listen to them for the rest of the evening. Okay, Peggy, thank you for that introduction. Peggy and I go, really go back a long way. Before I begin, I'd also just like to introduce another member of the Martin Luther King Birthday Observance Committee, Barbara Landberg, please stand. Yeah. This, this committee truly represents the ideals of Dr. King. They are a very active and involved group. And um, you would sometimes think that they got paid, they work so hard. So we're really, truly grateful for them. Peggy, thank you for telling a little of my story. We all have a story to tell. As we look at civil rights at 50, I'm aware that time reflects that, that particular particular time reflects much of my story and is a crucial part of the story of African Americans in our country. I believe, therefore, that it is important that we take a glimpse of the years that preceded the Civil Rights era to fully understand the importance of the Civil Rights Movement. It was in the 17th century that the first record of American slavery in the English colonial America began. A lifetime of indigent servitude based solely on race. Slavery was legally recognized in Virginia and the ability to ship slaves from Africa to the colonies began. The 18th century was characterized by frequent rebellions 
the South wanted to keep slavery in place, even though by this time the cotton gin had been invented and would have need, the need for labor would have been less. But they wanted to hold on to slavery. By the 19th century, the importation of slaves in the U.S. was banned. Abolitionist movement with such leaders as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman helped to free thousands of slaves. But ultimately, the major event was the Civil War that began in 1860 and lasted until 1865. That really changed the landscape of African Americans. In addition, the old laws dating back to 1859 you remember the Dred Scott decision that denied citizenship to all black people. And in 1896, Plessis versus Ferguson decision that determined that separate but equal facilities were legal. Somehow, they got the separate, but they lost the equal. This underscored the plight of African Americans in this country. After the Civil War, the Reconstruction period was met with a fierce backlash in the form of Jim Crow, a system of segregation that would last until the almost 1960s. Nearly 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, African Americans, especially in southern states, were living in an unequal world of disenfranchisement, segregation, race-inspired violence, and of course, Jim Crow laws that denied them access to public theaters, classrooms, restrooms, trains, buses, and the legal system. My story began miles from these shores. It is born in the struggle of the Middle Passage the laws that declare the capturing of slaves unlawful and acceptable. The auctioning off of my great-grandmother, a slave in Bedford, Virginia. My grandfather, who escaped the cotton field with the hope of becoming more than a sharecropper. A father who, in many ways, was responsible for bringing Dr. Martin Luther King to Montgomery and a mother whose childhood classmate and friend, Mrs. Rosa Parks, changed my world. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, the great state that attempted to succeed from the Union in 1863, the cradle, the cradle of the Confederacy, the place where the first Confederate flag was made and unfurled and ironically, the place that launched Dr. Martin Luther King to national prominence. It was in 1955 that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a public city bus, defying Southern laws that launched the Montgomery bus boycott, a movement that began a wave of protests throughout our nation to end discrimination based solely on color. Many of you, this movement, I'm sorry, uh, many of you know the story of the Montgomery bus boycott. It was well documented and we believe was really the foundation of many of the later movements that helped to end discrimination. The year-long struggle to end discrimination imposed on African Americans who rode the city bus daily was not just keeping people off of the bus, but it was a hardship because in Montgomery, the major occupation for African Americans, and especially African American women, was domestic work, and they depended greatly on the public transportation. It was not unusual for the debutized bus driver, and by the way, 
all bus drivers were white, to yell at a person of color to give up their seats for a white passenger. Often, one would have to stand or get completely off of the bus. Coupled with that, the bus driver would ask for the money sometimes at you enter the front of the bus, demand that you step off, go to the bed, back of the bus to get on. Before reaching, being able to get on, however, often the arm of the sleep of the passenger was caught in the bus. So it was not just the inability to go and sit in a segregated section on the bus, but it was a cruel punishment that went along with it. Much effort that had been made through the years to end this practice, but the laws remained the same. Like Mrs. Parks, we had endured this through the years, and many people were kicked off of the bus, threatened and jailed for refusal to comply with this unjust rule which was already unjust in that you had to sit in a particular section, but the bus driver could ask you to get up and leave that section until there were enough seats for the whites who wanted to get on and sit. Many times people had to get off the bus. But on December 5th, 1955, having worked all day in a, in a downtown department store, one that she could not drink from the water fountain, eat at the restaurant, or use the restroom. Mrs. Parks was just tired. Not only were her feet tired, but she was tired of the injustice, and so she refused to move. Dr. King led the boycott successfully for over a year, not without problems, of course, if only not riding the bus had been the issue. That was bad enough, but there were drive-by shootings, arrests, and bombings of homes. I got to know Dr. King as a friend of my family. He was minister of the church, and, sir, and I served as a gopher during the Montgomery boycott movement. I typed letters, wrote releases for the newspaper, and often followed him to meetings to report to his family that he had arrived at his destination without incident or harm. The night that his house was bombed, we happened to have been in a meeting planning strategies to keep the boycott movement going. When we learned that his house had been bombed, we immediately jumped up to leave Dr. King cautioned us to sit down. He had been informed that the house had been bombed. They did not know the conditions of his family. But he said to us that night, no matter what has happened to my family, this non-violent movement will continue. I do think that though I never thought of myself as being a violent person, I truly learned the meaning, the true meaning of nonviolence. Upon reaching his home, we found disaster, broken windows, furniture blown from the house. Fortunately, Mrs. King and her baby daughter, Yolanda, were unharmed. Thousands, hundreds of people had gathered with bats and guns and things to retaliate. By this time, several city officials also had arrived with televisions and all. One city official said, we will find who did this and we will put that person away. Well, we knew that that was just rhetoric, that that had never happened before, and it certainly, we didn't believe what happened that night. My father happened to have been standing next to Dr. King who, after assessing the damage and finding out that his family was well, came to quell the audience that had assembled. And he said to them, put away your weapons. This is a nonviolent movement. 
and we will continue in a nonviolent way. My father responded to the city council person that we're not so much concerned tonight about who threw the bomb to try to destroy this house, but we are concerned about your actions, the things that you do to help to perpetuate this kind of incident uh, continuing to, to occur. It was the coming together of all people in Montgomery that made the Montgomery boycott so successful. Old, black, white, young came together and helped the domestic workers get to work every day, which kept them off of the buses. It was also the professionals in the town, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, and other professionals who aided in this. It was, as you can see, because the buses were not running, there was much need for financial assistance. So people came together from all over the town, but not only from all over the town, but from all over the country. Support was sent in to help to support the rights of people to sit on a bus and not be uh, abused. Because of the successful Montgomery bus boycott, public transportation was desegregated all over the country. This, this movement led to the formation of many groups, such as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the sit-ins in North Carolina, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coalition, CORE, Congress for Racial Equality, and many others that helped to create the momentum of change that could not be stopped. As demands for the presence of Dr. King increased all over the country, people were calling and asking for him to come to help us out in our town with the discrimination in housing, in jobs. Uh, and so he moved back to Atlanta to be with his father, who was minister of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. He could be more flexible working with his father and increased his ability to be able to call when he was to, to serve when he was called. My husband and I and son also moved. After leaving, living in Louisiana, we moved to New York. While we were well aware that African Americans were marginalized everywhere in our country, we were determined that our son would not have to continue to cry to go into a public park or to question why he could not drink from a water fountain. We, however, upon moving north, immediately encountered problems of racial discrimination. We were denied the opportunity to buy a house in the section of, in certain sections of town in Teaneck, New Jersey. We were greeted by signs that said, have you looked elsewhere? Not for sale. We immediately became involved, however, when we moved into the section, the northeast section of the town in working to help to discriminate housing practices. On Saturdays and Sundays, we would, we would join with our white friends and counterpartners and test these unlawful laws. The information we gathered was used later by federal courts as a part of a massive lawsuit that helped change the discriminating laws against people in, of color in Bergen County. Be because of the housing pattern in Teaneck, the area in which we live became increasingly African American. When we first moved on our street, for example, we were possibly the third African American family to move in. 
Now, we are all African American. There are no white families in that town. We reached out to the community to help to talk about and to work with trying to maintain an integrated kind of community. Not because we thought that there was something magical about living next to someone who was a different color than you, but we knew that where the majority resided, services were always better and greater. This was what was also true in our schools. As our neighborhood changed, the neighborhood school became increasingly African American. So my husband and I walked through the neighborhood, met with the superintendent and other officials in the school, and we talked about how we could maintain a more equitable and uh, school situation that would provide opportunities for all. Because research had indicated to us that as schools become increasingly African American, especially in the North, something happens. The services begin to diminish. The teachers begin to flee. And so that, and the total interest in education seems to go down. So we did not want that to happen. We worked and finally we were able to, along with the board, to determine a plan of action. The first plan of action was a volunteer school plan. That meant that a parent could volunteer their child to any school in the town. You see, the only school where African Americans were attending was in our neighborhood because of the housing discrimination. That year, under the volunteer plan, 13 African American children were bused out to schools all over Teaneck, but only three children of white families came into the Bryant School. We knew then that, that was not a solution to the problem. After much meetings and meetings and meetings, we were able to come up with, the board came up with a centralized sixth grade plan. And that meant that our neighborhood school would be the centralized school. And that all students, students from all over the town would come to the centralized school. That was the most successful uh, plan that we could have imagined. Though it did not come easily. It did come, though, without court sanction or without riots or massive protests. We argued and yelled at each other, but we were able to find solution. The centralized sixth grade became the highest achieving school in the district. It was not until 1969 that the Supreme Court ruled that all schools in all districts must end segregation, now and hereafter. The court, which had now received its first African-American jurist, Thurgood Marshall, left no room for doubt. Civil rights at 50, where are we today and what impact has the past, have the past 50 years shown us? What is our future? It has been reported that our classrooms are more segregated today than they were in the 70s. The right to vote is being challenged everywhere. Discrimination in housing is rearing its ugly head. And oh yes, according to Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow has arrived. It seems to me that much has changed, but much remains. What we have learned is that to obtain true justice and peace, we must recognize 
that we are all one, one human race. Anwar Fazel, a, a Malaysian writer, says it best. We all drink from one water. We all breathe from one air. We rise from one ocean and we live under one sky. Remember, we are one. The newborn baby cries the same. The laughter of children is universal. Everyone's blood is red. Our hearts beat the same song. Remember, we are one. We are all brothers and sisters, one family, only one earth. Together we live, together we die. Remember, we are one. Peace be on you, brothers and sisters. Peace be on you. The struggle continues. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. And I'd like to thank you for, for, for so many things, and in, in this context, for providing a rich and personal and really profound history and historical look and context for thinking about the civil rights movement uh, in one sense 50 years old and another sense much older than that in terms of the legacy of the struggle. Um, and before I attempt to sort of build on that and talk a bit about what the, I think is one of the key or paramount civil rights issues that we face today, mom alluded to it, the new Jim Crow. Um, I did just want to digress for one moment and, and, and say and congratulate the audience for not just the, the many years of struggle and various ways that you have remained steadfast um, in the struggle for civil rights and human rights. Um, you know, I was sitting in the back talking to my sister earlier, and one of the things that we always talk about is the need to see more young people uh, at these types of events. And we always struggle to get young folks out, you know, to continue the legacy. And, and there are some younger folks here. Um, younger. And some older. Um, and so, but I was thinking, you know, it's really, it, it, and it's true, and we, we definitely all agree we need our younger folks to, to take on this struggle and to be part of this legacy. But it's a celebration that our older brothers and sisters are out continuing to do this work. It's a real testament to your, to your commitment. And, you know, it's cliche, but age really is just a number. If you, if you don't think so, you should have seen my mother driving down here because we were running late. <laughs> she's, she's something else. And um, I tell mom, it's all right, we'll, they'll be there. But seriously though, she's, I, we, my family and friends and many of you know, we have a hard time keeping up with her. But that's the spirit, that's the commitment, right? That really, it really takes to continue to fight this fight because it's such a tremendous fight that's in front of us. And so it's been a very long history, a long struggle really dating back to even prior to the Middle Passage, right? I mean, we could, we could trace the historical uh, legacy deep into history. We don't have time for that today, but it's mindful, we should be mindful that we should always connect the dots, right? As we think about our present, we must understand our past in order to know where we're going. And so as was mentioned, there has been great sacrifice, great amount of blood, sweat, and tears that has brought us to where we are today. And there has been great progress. But as Mom mentioned, we are faced with serious issues today, the least, one of which, which is not the least of those issues, is the quote unquote new Jim Crow, which I want to talk about a bit. Uh, basically, the new Jim Crow, in, in this context, speaking about the crisis in this nation, 
particularly facing young men, but not just men, women as well, but young people of color who are caught up in and overwhelmed by and oppressed by the criminal justice system. But before we get into that, I just wanted to touch on and piggyback, if I, if I may, a bit on some of what Mom shared in terms of historical, historical legacy. I mean, how, how did we get here is a question we should continue to ask ourselves. And I think one way of thinking about this is to acknowledge that this nation, this society still has, we still grapple with what I would refer to as an uh, uh, unresolved issue. We have several unresolved issues, but one of the major one is still, what is to become of the former slave? How will the African American and other people of color who have come to this country in various ways for various reasons, how will they, will they be fully integrated into society and what will that look like? That is still yet unresolved. Even in the era of a fascinating, um, commendable, important political event in the election of Barack Obama, the first African American president. Certainly something to be celebrated, but yet the issue is still unresolved. And we see that in various ways. And the new Jim Crow is one of the paramount ways that that continues to remind us that we aren't there yet, that this question still needs to be answered. And so if we look back in history at the roots of this unresolved issue, we should remember, even you know, prior, after the, the, the Middle Passage and the, the advent of slavery in this country, that the African American, the black person, was defined as inhuman, not fully a human being, right? Not worthy of rights, of human rights, of respect, of dignity, right? Not much more than an animal to be fed, to be worked until they died, to be bred, and on went the cycle. And even if we look at the Constitution and look at the development of this nation as it became the United States of America, how the African American was defined as three-fifths a human being. Some have tried to minimalize that by saying, well, that was just a sort of um, construction that only had to do with property rights and the vote. But it was, it was that. Right? It was a mechanism that uh, had to do with the landowner's um, um, ability to, to, to maintain political power and gain power. But behind that, there were some deep-seated assumptions, right? Deep-seated feelings and deep-seated practices that defined black folks as inhuman and treated them as such. And I think that it's important for us not to gloss over that and to think that that has totally been erased in this nation perhaps way more subtle than it was then, but still manifesting in the vast disparities that black folks face in this country if we look at health care, if we look at housing, if we look at education. By every measure, we see vast disparities. And one must question, are we viewed, are we treated, are we uh, ingrained in this fabric of this society as a full human being, as a full citizen? And so a great struggles would take place of course, the Civil War itself, a massive, bloody, horrendous undertaking, which is hard to fathom, really, when we think about it. You know, films and books to help us to try to understand what, what great sacrifice took place. And with the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, and then a series of, of, of acts, freedom was brought to the African Americans, or so it seemed, or so we hoped. And so when the 13th Amendment was passed, which abolished slavery, then the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed to grant full citizenship. Then we had the 14th Amendment, which granted equal rights under the law and due process. The 15th Amendment, uh, which, uh, which brought the right to vote. Um, the Voting Rights Amendment, all of this sweeping legislation um, and events that took place to try to enfranchise the former slave and make them a full part of this society. The Reconstruction period was one which is also hard to understand at this time. There was great amount of effort on the part of obviously the former slave, on the part of many white allies in this country, primarily in the North, primarily but not just so, the Freedmen's Bureau. Great attempts, great hopes, the idea of uh, every former slave would get 40 acres and a mule, 
right? Public education really has its roots in the Reconstruction period. All of this was surrounding what would happen, attempting to address this yet unresolved question of what would happen to the former slave. Great strides and for a while, great hope and great progress. We saw the election of black officials. We saw a number of strides being made on, on, on the part of those who had recently been freed from slavery. But what was to follow was a tremendously forceful and ugly backlash known as Jim Crow. And it's important to understand, and I think we all know that Jim Crow was very intentional. It was orchestrated. It was complex. It looked different in different places. But overall, it was a well-organized attempt to disenfranchise the former slave, to, to pull back, to wipe away all of the gains that had been made and that were being made and that were hoped for in the near future. And that Jim Crow process did a number of things. It, 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 it attempted, in essence, to re-enslave the African American. Subjugation, discrimination, segregation, right? But also something which was a major part of it was criminalization. The passing of laws, local and statewide, that basically criminalized being black and being a former slave. It was against the law not to have a job. Right? Against the law to be walking down the street at certain times of the day. Basically creating an opportunity whereby the former slave could, in essence, be re-enslaved. And so part of the Jim Crow era was something called the convict lease system, where people who had not long been off of the plantation were arrested, were charged, were criminalized, and put in work camps where they were leased out for labor, found themselves back on the plantations that they had recently left, working for little or no money, daily finding themselves in greater debt than when they'd gotten there. And so much of the struggle of Reconstruction had been wiped away, and the backlash had been successful. And so we know that the civil rights struggle, which really began then, if you think about it, right, has certainly not been a straight line. It's been one of these, right, backwards, forwards, up and down, and that's what we're facing. And that's, in essence, what the Jim Crow is talking about, that process. Where are we now? And so as a result of the Jim Crow backlash, and even during that, I should say, and always, there's always been resistance. There's always been pushback. There's always been struggle. And we know the history of those who had fought from the very beginning, right? It's even we read about Sin Q, who fought on the very ships trying to, and took over the ship and attempted to bring it back to Africa. And then those on the plantation, most famously Harriet Tubman, who helped to construct and utilize the Underground Railroad to bring slaves uh, off of the plantations to freedom. Frederick Douglass, of course, a great leader whose words we continue to hold on to today without a struggle. There can be no, there can be no success. There can be no freedom. Booker T. Washington, who believed wholeheartedly in the need for black folks to develop the skill and the power to uh, and, and the opportunity to care for themselves, to build for themselves, to educate themselves, who debated also another great leader, W.E.B. Du Bois, who believed in the power of education and the concept of the talented 10th, that the 10% of black folks who could receive college education could go on and then come back to the masses and uplift the race. And there was great debate that was taking place between Booker T. and Du Bois and others. How, what would be the fate? Of, 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 of the former slave, of the black folks. Great debate among wh white allies and those who were still interested in perpetuating Jim Crow and perpetuating segregation. This was a major issue that confronted this nation. At the core of this nation, it was a major issue as it remains today. And from Booker T, uh, surprisingly to many, Marcus Garvey, Booker T was really Marcus Garvey's idol and mentor. Um, although Garvey is associated with a Back to Africa movement, he learned his ideas of doing for self, of, 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 of building your own farm, farms, uh, developing your own skills, um, building your own schools and those things. He got that from Booker T, sort of ironically, because Booker T was kind of painted as the sort of Uncle Tom who wouldn't stand up against and fight for civil rights overtly, 
right, but who was fighting for a sort of economic power, right? And then from Garvey, we have really the roots of the Nation of Islam, where we got Malcolm X that grew out of Garvey. Out of W.E.B. Du Bois, we had A. Philip Randolph, who led the Pullman Porter movement and the union movement to help enfranchise black workers. We had great political figures, probably the greatest of whom, and the first, I would argue, uh, major political figure of black power, Adam Clayton Powell, who and to this day I think is uh, misunderstood and certainly not, desert, not receiving the type of attention and understanding that he does deserve in terms of the legacy of political power um, that he brought to the struggle. Then of course Thurgood Marshall, who originally as a attorney for the NAACP and then ultimately a lawyer who argued for the Brown versus Board of Education, which was to turn around Plessy versus Ferguson, outlawing separate but equal. All of this was part of the civil rights movement. All of this was going on um, as, as the struggle continued. And at that later point in the 50s, as the Montgomery bus boycott was taking place that mom talked about. All of this led to what is now called, I would call the modern civil rights era. And that's the 50 year point where we can say the civil rights movement is, is 50 years old. And so Dr. King at that point represented, I think something that's analogous to what happened at Reconstruction. It's, it's sort of a cycle, right? There was great hope. You, you all were there. Through much of what I've talked about, many of us in this audience were there. Um, great hope, great uh, mobilization and organization um, for civil rights, for peace, to, to gain human rights and equality in this nation. And great strides were taken. And then we had the Civil Rights Act take place. We had the Voting Rights Act. It's, it's interesting how history repeats itself. We had, to, we had had that 100 years prior. But there was a need for it again for various reasons that we're talking about. Um, various legislation, the Great Society legislation of L, that started by JFK, continued by L, um, but Lyndon Baines Johnson, much of that legislation written by Adam Clayton Powell, right? All of this was taking place in this really hopeful era that perhaps this country could, could claim its, the, the rhetoric that it speaks and truly live out equality and justice for all. But once again, a backlash would take place, wouldn't it? The powers that be chose power over people. And we can see this really clearly in L, what I call Johnson's conundrum. He embraced, by all accounts, civil rights and supported much of what Dr. King and others were fighting for. But he and the powers that be behind him behind the presidency, uh, tried to sell the public, and you all know very well, civil rights domestically, but the Vietnam War, yeah. right, internationally, that we would accept, but we'll pass civil rights, but give us our war. Give us our military industrial complex. Give us our war machine. Let's continue these international policies which are devastating and continuing to impoverish third world nations, right? Yet we will pass domestic civil rights legislation and many people weren't for it. Much of the, the, the coalition that surrounded King at a certain point went for it. Even the brilliant strategist Bayard Rustin went for it, but King didn't. And he stood, held fast that he would oppose the war he made the connection between civil rights in this country and human rights abroad. And so King and a number of others then we would witness, would experience the horrible assassinations. King, Bobby, prior to that JFK, uh, many others, some names we know, thousands of names we don't know. Their families know, but we don't know them as public figures. Great loss of life, great repression, great in number, uh, incarceration. Terrorism, really, I would call it, to stamp out this movement 
for peace, for human rights, for those who were connecting the dots between what happens to a black person in Mississippi and what happens in the fields of Vietnam or in Central Africa or in Asia, right? The connecting of the dots. And so really, the 70s and 80s represent, in my view, a, 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 very, a very complicated but troubling era in terms of civil rights. The assassinations for me represent a real repression. Of course, during that time, people in this room and others continued the fight, never have stopped fighting. And there was always a movement, at least one trying to, to maintain itself as a movement. And even interestingly, during the 70s and 80s, you see uh, the black struggle turn to electoral politics. Again, we see the, the, start to see the election and, and the growth of black congressmen, black mayors of major cities and those kinds of things, um, which ultimately would lead to a Jesse, right, to Shirley Chisholm, to a Jesse Jackson, to a Barack Obama. Um, but some, some other major things that were taking place in the 70s and 80s that I think uh, connect to the legacy and bring us to where we are today in terms of the new Jim Crow, which I'll speak to momentarily. Um, and what were the major trends that were, took place during this era, during the Nixon-Reagan uh, era? Massive consolidation of wealth. Further growth between the haves and the have-nots, right? The decimation of pathways to the quote-unquote middle class. Solidification of class, of what now we would argue is even cast in this society without the ability for upward mobility. An emphasis on social control, military, to, um, a military style of policing, which was just referenced earlier, which we're revisiting now today, has its roots at that point. Um, uh, the type of social control which we saw in Bull Connor in Birmingham, right, law and order, so much of the, many times, the law and order to stamp out justifiable, legitimate protests against the status quo. But then also mixed in with a general sense of tough on crime. As the urban centers continue to decay because they had been abandoned and the lack of investment in them, and the influx of drugs, which is another speech, a different conversation, which we don't have time for. But as those things happen, a sort of tough on crime, and then the war on drugs, which Michelle Alexander talks about in her book, The New Jim Crow, is one of the pillars of the new Jim Crow. Drug policy. And so with this drug policy, which parenthetically, there are quotes from Nixon and Halderman and others, how it should be targeted at black communities. And in fact, that the war on drugs started before there had, had even been a rise or a proliferation of drug substance abuse in the form of crack, right? Um, so the war on drugs was a political tool that was used. This is documented. Michelle Alexander talks about it, and it's documented in other historical works and other, in other literature. So we have this era of tough on crime. And it got to the point where even our liberal president, Bill Clinton, would be responsible for passing and sponsoring more repressive, tough on crime legislation than Reagan and Nixon before him. The Democrats decided they weren't going to be out toughed by the Republicans and, lose, and continue to lose elections because they were looked at as too soft. And so they backed this type of repression legislation. Uh, which in New York was known as the Rockefeller drug laws, and from state to state known by other names, but laws which, such as three strikes you're out, mandatory minimums where the judge would not have discretion on sentencing, uh, extremely long uh, terms of incarceration, and probably worse than all of that, the collateral consequences of having a felony, which is what the new Jim Crow is today, what the, 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 the saddle that people carry now as a result of being in the system. Also during this era, a part of it was what was called the Southern strategy, right? All of these things were connected, where, where the, summon, the Southern Democrats became Republicans, right? Through race politics. All of this was woven together during that era to bring us where we are. And in terms of the new Jim Crow, uh, problem, vast proliferation of the prison system. By 85, there were maybe 300,000 people in America's prisons. 
and now there are nearly 2.5 million in those prisons. Largely driven by drug and crime policy that brought to jail many first time nonviolent drug involved offenders, right? The vast, on the backs of black and brown, primarily young men. That's the new Jim Crow. And that's what we're facing today. So the new Jim Crow, or as uh, Reverend Al Sharpton calls it, uh, James Crow Esquire. Right, he put a suit on and carries a brief briefcase. The new Jim Crow then is like the old Jim Crow. It's not just sad and uh, difficult and unfortunate results, unintended results. It, it has many of those, but at its core, it's intentional. And that's critical to understanding it. I'm not the type of conspiracy theorist that thinks five guys in the room just planned all this one day. No, it's not that simple. But it is, in fact, intentional. There are major forces at play. The politics that we've described have helped to perpetuate this. And we've seen it from state to state. And so the key to the new Jim Crow is the criminalization of young black and brown men in particular. We talked about the three strikes. We talk about the disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement. So now, as a result of having a felony for many states around the country, not allowed to vote, you can't get financial aid for college, you can't live in public housing, you're virtually unemployable. In some places, you can't get food stamps or public assistance. It's total disenfranchisement akin to living in America during and right after slavery. Thus the term, the new Jim Crow. And thus, I would argue, a major civil rights issue that we must be fighting uh, to correct today. And so, in the news, from day to day, and it seems to be way more often than previously, we have the Fergusons of the world taking place, right? We have people being strangled to death on the corners for selling Marlboro cigarettes. We have all these instances of brutality, which are, you know, horrible, of course. But the problem is, I think, is that not enough people are connecting to the dots. These are not just events that happen because of uh, one or two bad apples, right, in a department. And, there, and the problem isn't just police and police departments. This connects back to our entire criminal justice system, which is a major part of our public policy as a nation. And until we connect those dots and see what's happening in Ferguson, as well as what's happening all over the country in terms of the disenfranchisement of so many uh, young men of color, and see this as a major civil rights issue, we won't be able to get our hands on it. We won't be able to organize around it, mobilize, and make serious change. And so connecting of the dots, I think, is the main thing that we need to do. So we need to organize ourselves. We need to go out door to door and use social media and whatever tool available to us. We need to use politics. We need to hold our politicians accountable. When we need to, this, need, this needs to be a major question that any elected official must comment on and speak to. We need to mobilize, we need to grow this movement. We need to continue this struggle and understand that while we have come such a long way and have made great strides, which we should celebrate, need to celebrate on a daily basis, we do have so far to go. We have major problems in, in front of us, the new Jim Crow among them. But as we have always believed, as I believe Harriet Tubman believed, and all those that we've talked about following her, we can and we will win. Let's continue to fight. Thank you.